All right, let's kick this off. I'm Blake Bingham. I'm the uh, adjudication program manager from the Utah Division of Water Rights. Um, the name is Water is for Fighting. They wanted a sexy name, so I gave them what they wanted, and then hopefully it uh, hit the mark and got you all interested in what's going on here. So let's move on. Let's see. So, you know, the, the quote is often attributed to Mark Twain, although it, it's not really. It's, you know, whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting. And, and here we have a picture of two neighbors in Utah discussing water rights, as is often the case. And what you'll find in rural communities is a lot of this discussion, although, you know, this is kind of makes a, a joke of it, you know, at least it's, it's person to person. If someone's still into someone else's water, there's uh, a discussion that needs to be made about turns on a ditch. It's usually person to person. And so these are neighbors discussing water rights in rural Utah, and then we go to, you know, complete strangers discussing water rights in urban Utah. And uh, what this is, is uh, that poor Mrs. Cragen uh, received one of my notices in the mail. It's a very legal-looking notice. And rather than simply calling me and asking me about or even attending the public meeting that the notice was about, uh, she thought it would be a great idea to call Gephardt um, to come and interview me. At the time, I didn't know that it was Gephardt. It's just simply a producer and a camera person showed up in my office, I did the interview, and as I was kind of escorting him out the door, it's kind of have a little bit of fun. I said, hey, whatever you do, don't sick Gephardt on me. And she kind of turned to me and she's like, well, that's what this is. So I went through the whole interview, um, not really understanding what it was all about until I saw it on the news uh, a few uh, days later. But it was a good news story. Things seemed to turn out all right after all. Mike's got a little bit of feedback. There we go. But it could be worse, right? It could be the Dakota Access Pipeline. So at least we don't have uh, you know, sovereign nation and uh, petrol and uh, environmental issues. So I'll, I'm fine with Gephardt, you know, compared to other fights for water throughout the, the nation going on. So let's talk a little bit about the historical context. I always kind of start um, these presentations to, to provide this backdrop so that people understand why we do adjudications. You know, it's important to understand where we came from to know what we're doing now and, and where we're going in the, in the future. So in 1847, we all know the story, um, or we should. Uh, Mormon pioneers entered the Salt Lake Valley and, and began um, diverting the waters from City Creek in order to soften the ground so they could harrow it up and, and plant up some late season crops. Uh, of course, later they, they built City Creek Mall on top of that. Um, a year later, Brigham Young declares that uh, there wouldn't be any private ownership of the waters in the state of Utah, that they belong to the people. Um, this is actually prophetic, to, to, so to speak, because the Utah Code actually says that the waters of Utah are owned by the public. Um, so he, he actually got that one right. Um, but as you can imagine, from 1847 through 1850, what we now know as Utah transitioned from being a part of Mexico to this kind of quasi-religious state of Deseret and then into the territory of Utah. Well, people were just kind of sitting on their thumbs. Of course, they were diverting water. They were uh, growing crops. They were doing all kinds of things. And so we didn't just all of a sudden wake up one day and have this water right code in place. People were using water long before we ever had laws um, that uh, guided the jurisdiction of appropriation and these other issues. So as a result of that, uh, this kind of evolution uh, the diversions of water from streams were kind of on a community basis to meet the immediate needs of the settlers. Um, the doctrine of priority kind of evolved from church leaders' recognition of groups who first put the water to use, and then later subsequent settlers kind of moving in. And you had this con concept of primary and secondary rights. And then even on a further el el evolution was when the mining uh, miners came in and they had that influence of first in right and first in time. So really what we have now today, although we call it the, the system of prior appropriation, it's really a hybrid of this class system of water rights and, and the doctrine of uh, prior appropriation. Um, and of course, conflicts were settled by, by the church back then. And you know, if you had a, a qualm, you'd take it to the bishop. And if you, had, you didn't like what he said, you'd take it to the state high council. It was kind of like a, the, the probate court and the appellate court. And that's how everything was kind of settled back then. Now, you know, I, I usually give this brief or this presentation when I do an adjudication. And I often have people, well, I have, I've had one person storm out saying he didn't want to hear about Mormon theology in, in a water rights presentation. But they're so intertwined, so you'll have to bear with me uh, as we kind of walk through some of this. 
Now we enter into the territorial era, and so in 1852, the, the first territorial legislature attempted to kind of sep separate church power and the water distribution. So they passed a law that authorized the county court to distribute all the water and, and kind of gave all the, the power to the, the probate court. Now, that was interesting because the probate courts were kind of, they were ran by the local citizens. You know, you, you didn't have to be a judge, whereas the district courts were still appointed by federal um, entities. And so it was kind of an attempt at moving power away from the church, but in fact, the people who were the probate judges were the same, were the same bishops and same uh, stake, high, uh, stake presidents, et cetera, that were deciding these issues before. So really, there wasn't much of a change there, and in really Salt Lake, Salt Lake County was the only um, county that kind of followed this. The rest of the uh, state, they continued, or the territory continued to divert without public restriction. Well, in 1877, the Desert Land Act was passed, and this was an effort to establish or to, to populate the West. And so as part of that act and part of some subsequent case law, this, the title between water and land was severed. Now, if you think of a, a riparian doctrine, if you live next to a stream, you have the, the right to use that water. Well, this kind of severed that altogether. So now that you could, you could divert water from far away and apply it on land that's nowhere near the source of the water. And so this was important in the evolution of this concept of prior appropriation. And also delegated um, to the state or the territory the authority to, um, to handle water appropriations, which, you know, in hindsight, to us that seems like common sense, but think of it, the government land office at the time, where they were the ones issuing patents on land, it seemed to make sense that they would do the same thing for water. However, this obviously um, severed that. Uh, in 1880, they did another attempt to kind of separate things. They, instead of having the, the, the probate courts handle water issues, they appointed county uh, selectmen who were kind of ex officio water commissioners. This was found to be unconstitutional because you essentially had people who were appointed um, settling property rights issues. And so um, they decided it was no good. Anyways, Salt Lake County was the only one that uh, really followed it again. Consequently, uh, confusion over existing water rights continued in spite of the efforts of the Utah Territorial Legislature, and the church continued to fill that power vacuum. And a classic example is the 1879 um, High Council decision that divided the, the river, the Spanish Fork River, into among the various canal companies, and that is still um, in use to this day. They still honor that decree. And of course, it's had some sub subsequent decrees that kind of modified it, but that's the basis of the how the Spanish Fork River is divided. So as we move into statehood, um, around this time frame, there was kind of a movement about to dealing with water. And there were some people who were advocating that the state take control of the waters. And then, you know, that all rights had to come from the state, or the state owned all the waters. And so there was a real big fight over it. And so rather than do anything, they decided just to punt. And the only thing they put into the Constitution at the time was to simply say, any rights that were being used are hereby recognized and confirmed moving forward. So if you've been using water before the state became a state, you're good to go afterwards. They decided just not even to deal with water because it was too contentious and there appeared to be some nefarious or ulterior motives. In 1897, the Office of the State Engineer was created, and that's what we now call the Division of Water Rights. Um, but his, his only real job was to kind of go through the state and do these hydrologic surveys to determine how much these stream sources could provide. And that was really the limits. They were trying to figure out, all right, who's diverting water and how much water do we have left? And so they kind of tasked the state engineer to do that. But it was kind of a limited uh, capacity that he really did anything. You still had to kind of go pound your, your claim in at this. And, and really how you, you, you claimed a water right back then is you go physically stake a claim at the point of diversion. And then you'd go file that claim at the post office or at the county court or at the um, county recorder's office. But again, that was too onerous for many people to comply with, so it was largely ignored. Well, in 1902, the, the uh, United States Reclamation Service, which is the precursor to the Bureau of Reclamation, was established to reclaim the West, the arid West. And they, they do that, as you well know, by building these gigantic projects. However, they were really reluctant to do that in any state or territory that didn't have a comprehensive water law because they didn't want to go in and spend all this time and effort and investment in these large projects if the rights that to divert or store that water weren't secured. They didn't know if someone had already uh, allocated that water. 
And so really they told the states, hey, get into compliance or you're not going to get a project. So it's no, no, uh, it's no uh, coincident that uh, the Utah decided the next year to pass a comprehensive water law, um, which provided for appropriating future water rights, but also looking backwards and recording all existing water rights that had already been claimed uh, and the adjudication of them by the courts. Unfortunately, in, in true uh, Utah legislature fashion, they, they failed to provide funding to the courts, so nothing really happened. And they attempted to fix this later on, you know, so it took them about 15 years um, down the road. They realized, hey, there's just been no movement on these adjudications, what's going on. And so they came up with a, this, this, this idea to say, well, what we'll do is we'll have the state engineer go out, do these hydrographic surveys, and then come up with a recommendation as to what the water rights should be, and then provide that to the court, and then let the court decide on that. That way the state engineer is busy doing his thing, and the judge can do his things rather than trying to figure out all the, this jumble, these jumbles of claims. And so that's largely what the system of adjudication is based on to this day. The state engineer still goes out and does a survey. He still makes a recommendation to the court, and then the court defers to that recommendation unless it's objected to. But we'll cover a little bit more of that down the road here. So let's look at a historical case for adjudication. Prior to the, the enactment of that 1903 law, uh, water rights kind of fell into f one of five or, or several categories. Um, first, there's those that were decreed by ecclesiastical leaders. Uh, we've kind of talked about that. Those that were filed for uh, record at the county or at the courthouse. You had those that were simply uh, decreed by a court, um, and, and they involved limited parties. Uh, you had those that were just unilateral agreements between parties, and then you had those that were never recorded anywhere. Simply someone was diverting its water up in the hills, felt no need to record it anywhere, um, never, no need to file for an appropriation, just continue to use it. And we still are dealing with those. We call them diligence claims. I mean, in essence, they put the water to, to diligent use prior to 1903 for surface rights, 1935 for underground water rights. And so those people can still make those claims these, these days. And that's why I say, you know, I don't always file a claim, but when I do, it's 100 years later. That's because that's kind of the nature of some of these claims we did. Um, consequently, the lack of definitive water law created a number of issues. First, there was no public record. You couldn't go to a, one place in the state of Utah and say, I want to know the water rights of this area, or I want to know the water rights of this area. You kind of had to search through all these other records, either at the county. And the county doesn't know where to put water stuff. You know, they're like, oh, it's kind of a property right deed, so we'll stick it over here. And you go to a different county recorder, and they'd have it filed somewhere else. Um, since there was no record, over-appropriation of stream sources was pretty common. And because of that over-appropriation, there was a lot of controversy, and it wasn't, wouldn't be settled until the church or the court stepped in. So let's talk about what is a general, a general stream adjudication or a water rights adjudication. You know, it's not just limited to streams. We also do underground water rights. But you can see a picture of Utah there. Each of those represents kind of a separate river drainage. Um, and what those represent, in truth, are the adjudic general adjudication uh, cases being taken on. So a general adjudication, as it name, name implies, is an is a action in state district court. And it binds all water users, so it's comprehensive in the fact that you leave no parties out. Because if you leave a party out, then they always have an opportunity to come back and say, hey, I'm, never, I'm not bound by that decree because I wasn't party to this litigation. Well, a general adjudication fixes that by binding everyone within the drainage, including the state engineer. The state engineer has kind of a, a particular um, dual hat. He's also one of the people, a uh, participant, but he's also a, uh, someone who makes a special recommendation to the judge. That's the title of code it's governed by. And the first general stream adjudications took place back in the 20s, um, the Severe, uh, the Weber, and the Virgin River. Those are kind of the early ones, the early efforts to get underway. Some of these other efforts started later. The one we're kind of more concerned about is the Utah Lake Jordan River adjudication. Here's the process, kind of a three-phase process. I'm going to cover this pretty quick. Um, first phase is kind of a petition and notice phase. And so if we go in and we want to do an adjudication, we'll send out notice, and then we'll send out summons. And that's what Mrs. Cragen was responding to. She received a summons. It was scary. The state of Utah is suing me because I have a water right. And that's why she called Gephardt on me. And then we have a public meeting, which uh, Mrs. Craig decided not to attend and call Gephardt instead. Um, then we have the second phase. And that's where we, we send out 
notice the individuals that they have to file a claim. They have 90 days to file that claim saying, hey, I, want a, I have a water right. This is what my water right. People who fail to file a water, a, a water user's claim, they get compiled into this book called the List of Unclaimed Rights. And in essence, this book goes before the judge, and the judge says, all right, no one's filed claims on these water rights. These water rights are deemed abandoned. Of course, there's an opportunity for claimants to object. They have 90 days to object. You do a public meeting before, all, before the decree is even rendered. And the final phase is kind of the, the boots on the ground CSI water rights investigation phase, where those claims that are investigated, I send my team out on the ground. They go and they check out the wells. They check out the ditches. They check out the irrigation, the stock, whatever is being claimed and they compare that with what's being beneficially used at the time. And then they bring that back. We make a recommendation, which is called a proposed determination of water rights. And that's what we submit to the judge. Um, again, claimants, if they don't like what we've suggested in that proposed determination, can object uh, to the judge. We have a public meeting. Then hopefully we have the final summons and say, hey, one more shot. Is, if there's anyone out there with a claim, bring it now. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to get a claim in again. And then um, we have to resolve any objections before the judge can issue a decree. So why do we conduct them? Well, first of all, we want to bring all the claims on the permanent record. You remember this guy, right? The guy that's secretly using water somewhere, doesn't decide to file a claim until 2016, although it's, you know, he claims a right of 1847, you know, that it's, his granddad's been using it for so long. Well, we want to bring those onto the permanent record. So adjudication reaches out, grabs those, and brings them in. And also underground water claims, which are in essence, are the same thing, but for groundwater. In 1935, they decided the waters are really connected, so if we're going to do it for surface waters, we're going to do it for groundwater as well. Federal Reserve rights, you want to learn, that's a great, basically, back in the turn of the 20th century, Fort Belknap Indian Reservation decided they needed water. However, all the water rights around them had already been appropriated. They took it to court. The Supreme Court said, hey, by virtue of the fact that Congress has set aside this reservation, there's an implied water right with it. So figure it out. However, we couldn't figure it out because you can't sue the United States because they have sovereign immunity. Well, back in 1952, Senator McCarran from Nevada wrote a, had a law passed that since, in essence waives federal sovereign immunity with regard to water rights adjudications, meaning we can sue the federal government and they have to come to state district court rather than at a federal court, which is a pretty significant deal. We want to prevent a multiplicity of suits. We kind of want to get this done in one fell swoop. We want to remove or reduce rights which have been wholly partially forfeited through non-use. In Utah, actually, in most of the Western United States, um, you have a limited amount of time to use it or you lose it. And then we want to find, get a final comprehensive decree on all water rights. And I'm just going to kind of blow through this slide a little bit. So this is kind of my theoretical um, water rights sl slide. Just say you're a farmer, you want to, you, you, you appropriate 33 acres of water. You get another 29 acres worth of shares in an irrigation company, um, eight acres out of a well because you really want to make sure that you have enough water for that good high uh, yielding ground, another 28 acres over here through an additional well. Well, if you total all that up, you have 98 acres. But in truth, you really only have a 62-acre footprint. And since the beneficial use is the, the limit basis of, of a right, you really ha only have a 62-acre water right. And even then, you're only irrigating 51 acres. And then the farmer decides, well, I, I don't really like farming. I, I want to grow a subdivision. Now what do you have? So you can kind of see the need to be able to go through, untangle some of these water rights. And we see this rampant today in, in Salt Lake County. So here's the Utah Lake Jordan River adjudication. I'm not going to go through the history if you want to know more about it. In essence, it's a big lawsuit started by Salt Lake City. They wanted to sue 3,000 people because it was during a drought and they needed the water. They decided, the Supreme Court said, hey, you can't do that. The state engineer's got to make a recommendation. So let's zero in on Salt Lake County and kind of discuss what we're doing these days because I'm running out of time. This is Salt Lake County. We have two areas. You have the 59 area to the west, 57 area to the east. These are further subdivisions. So, so these are what the state engineer actually uses as boundaries for his proposed determination, which he sends to the court. These blue ones, they've already been published. They've already been filed with the court. None of them have been decreed, but you can see most of them were done back in the 70s and the early 80s. You have one here, um, Harmony Park in 2012. That was my first one when I got this job. I had just come back from Afghanistan. They figured, hey, we'll just send them from one war zone to a new war zone. 
And so that's why I got uh, that one as my first one. But it was interesting because what we found out is nearly 90% of the wells in that area had long since been abandoned. You know, their parking lots and whatnot been urbanized. And so we decided, well, we really need to kind of get to the bottom of this in Salt Lake Valley. And so right now, these are the efforts we're undergoing. These are the proposed determinations, the subdivisions that are currently underway. So if you live in the Salt Lake Valley, you may hear about this. You may get a notice if you live in this area. You see all this non-shaded area. That's yet to be done. So we've been doing this since 1936. And we're, you know, roughly a little over halfway maybe. And that, those haven't even been decreed. So what are we doing to kind of streamline and stuff? This is one of my favorite quotes. Talking about general adjudications, one does not get out of a general adjudication is a sort of judicial black hole into which light, sound, lawyers, water, even judges, indeed the whole force of paper will disappear. The only way out is the other end. So we've been trying to get out the other end. Um, some of the ways we've been trying to do that is to revise or streamline the statute, um, make sure the process is a little bit more modernized, maybe allow people to submit claims online. So there have been some of that. Um, the court has appointed a special master that is in essence a little, is like a mini judge, right? And he, he rules on it, he can go through all the backlog of, of the objections and kind of expedite that part of it. Final, we wanna focus our adjudicative efforts and resources within the Salt Lake, Utah Valley. My program is a statewide program. However, most of my team is focused on Salt Lake and Utah Valley. And so that was kind of the emphasis. That's where most of the urbanization has occurred. That's where most of maybe the, the non-use, forfeiture, abandonment issues are occurring. And that's where we really need to kind of get dial in on as to what water resources we have um, appropriated and what we have left. So this concludes my presentation. I know I went really fast through a lot of material. I'm happy to take any questions from you at this time. You guys just soaking it in, right? I, I don't blame you. So the question is, you know, when she's been to the public meetings, there are a lot of people who don't understand, do they receive a formal summons in the mail, right? And that summons, it, yeah, and, and in fact, it looks like you're being sued because you are really being sued. You're, you're part of a civil action. You're not, you know, you're being joined, and so that is mandatory. There's just no way of getting around issuing summons. If we didn't, then someone could always say, hey, this, I'm not bound by this decree. So I wish there was a less scary way. Now, I try to preface, I try to, write a whole letter say, don't freak out, don't freak out, don't freak out, P.S., don't freak out, right, before the summons, even get to the summons. But it doesn't matter because once they hit that summons, it's like freak out time, right? Um, so we, we try, and if, if there's any, and that's part of what this process, the outreach, to make sure people understand what it's all about. Yeah, a lot of older folks, a lot of younger folks, a lot of people who think there's an agenda behind this, that there's some type of water grab by a municipality or something. They're kind of here to take my wall of my water. Am I out of time? Come work. Oh, yes, ma'am. Sure, that's a great question. Are there any, is there any flex and use it or lose it? There is, a, there's some um, qualifiers to it. Um, if you have a pending change, an approved change application on the water right, it's not subject to forfeiture. Um, you can tell municipalities have the best lobbyists because they're exempt from forfeiture altogether um, for as long as it's part of their 40-year plan. If they can't make it fit their 40-year plan, they need to find an engineer who can make it fit their 40-year plan. So in essence, see, they're, they're, they're immune. So there's a couple qualifiers, but the, the concept behind that is you want, they wanted, when they came up with that, they wanted to avoid speculation and monopolies or people appropriating whole river systems and then you are at the mercy of this one entity for any water. Although that may, some may argue that's what a public municipal, municipality does these days, but that's neither here nor there. But that's the, the whole point is to avoid people doing that, hoarding water and speculating with it. But there are some rules, but they probably don't apply to, to most situations. Yes, sir. So, not the, so that's another one of those qualifiers. You can file a non-use permit, and you can file an, another non-use permit, and 
but that's you're right. Does it do they does that allow them to speculate on the water? Maybe, but ultimately that's up to the legislature. I know there is some pending legislation this session meant to address some of the issues because you also have this Lazarus clause, right? That if you start using your water, even though it's been gone through a period of non-use, and you use it for 15 years, you can't be um, assessed for forfeiture. And so there's people that are kind of figure this out. It's like if I file enough non-use applications, I'll be able to get through that 15-year period, and then I'll be able to resurrect this water right. There's legislation attempting to kind of uh, seal that loophole this year, but um, yeah, it, it could. But you know, you got to keep in mind that. The last, I don't want to be the guy, I, you know, there's no point in being the water Gestapo. There's no, there's no point. You want people to use the water. Um, you want water to be available to people so people can drill wells or water rights to be available to them so they can drill wells or they can do developments, right? We're not trying to stifle water use. So I think there's some flexibility in recognizing that, yeah, the non-use applications are easily granted and maybe they, they allow some of that, but, you know, it's better on the, to be more lenient than kind of hard-nosed. Yes, ma'am, in the corner. So the question is, you know, we're saying, am I saying that their water rights not being used, and if we ever had a drought, that wouldn't be accessible? We got to kind of separate between paper water and real water. In the Salt Lake Valley, we are vastly overappropriating. I mean, we have way more paper water than we have wet water. So the water is always being used. It's just these water rights that are out of use are just need to be cleaned up and taken off the books so that when we look at our water use picture, we're not saying we're not overinflating what our demand is. I'm out of time, aren't I? Yeah. All right, thank you. You can uh, come and uh, see me one-on-one -on -one if you have following questions. Thank you very much.